All right, actually, I do need to grab one thing here because I wanted to do a contrast. Uh, the apostle, uh, or the apostle Paul, the author of Hebrews, is now doing a, a lengthy comparison and uh, addressing the issue of Christ as our high priest. And uh, of course, uh, we've been talking about him as he's out of the order of Melchizedek, he's not out of the Levitical priesthood. And so last week we touched on some of the contrasts, and, and I'm just going to refresh on these. The Levitical priesthood is an earthly priesthood, uh, and it was established on the carnal commandment. It was based on, on uh, uh, human lineage, genealogy, the tribe of Levi, and uh, for the high priest in particular, it had to be a descendant of Aaron, who was of the tribe of Levi. Uh, so a carnal commandment established the Levitical priesthood, the oath uh, is what established Jesus Christ as a priest under the order of Melchizedek. And that oath, that promise of God, that swearing of God, uh, establishes Jesus Christ as an eternal, unchanging priest and priesthood. Uh, the Levitical priesthood with the animal sacrifices was weak and unprofitable. It, it never took away one single sin. I mean, when you start thinking about all the blood and the, the guts and the animals that were flayed and burned and the blood taken, all of that activity, not one sin was removed because of any of that stuff. It was a foreshadowing of what Christ would do, and, and his blood would remove it all. So it was weak and unprofitable. We talked about last week how the Jews, what are they going to do? They're going to go right back to that system. And God's not going to be happy with that. Just as God was not going to be happy with these believers who were tempted to go back to that system, he is not going to be happy with the Jews who will go back and begin to They'll essentially trample underfoot the blood of, of the Son of God and, and have these sacrifices. Uh, uh, and, and so we know that there will be great uh, discipline and judgment on the Jewish people. But it was weak and unprofitable. So the, 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 the priesthood of Jesus Christ is strong and profitable and beneficial uh, because through it we receive eternal life. It achieves everything that, that the Levitical priesthood could not. Uh, the priests in the Old Testament, they died because they were sinners. The priest that we have now, the Lord Jesus Christ, lives forever, and therefore his priesthood is based off of an everlasting life, uh, whereas the priests in the Levitical priesthood had to be replaced. Uh, the priests were sinners. That's why they died. And they required sacrifices for their own sins before they could minister for the sins of the people. Uh, our great high priest, though, is holy and harmless and undefiled and... Uh, and uh, and, and so he, he's able to intercede. He's a man, and he's perfectly God, and he can intercede for us without a sacrifice for himself. Uh, the, the Levitical priesthood was, was changeable. It was temporary. Uh, now Jesus Christ for 2,000 years uh, and into eternity has, has, been, uh, has established an unchanging eternal priesthood. Uh, the sacrifice that the Levitical system could not save a person. Remember, everyone, everyone, is saved by faith in the word of God, the revelation of God. They're not saved by the blood of bulls and goats, all right, but by faith, and their faith is counted as righteousness. So, yes, there could be Israelites, individual Israelites, who, who maybe would come into contact with, with the, you know, the priestly system. Maybe they'd offer a sacrifice you know, here and there, whatever, uh, but those sacrifices could not save them. Ultimately, they had to have faith, and I do believe that it had to be faith in the coming Messiah. When you look and you read in the Gospels, uh, it's very clear that uh, the people anticipated the Messiah. It wasn't like, well, what do you mean this teaching of the coming Messiah? They all knew. What happened was, though, they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. So, so the knowledge of this seed that would come uh, was passed on through generations. But, but bottom line is, anyone who responded in faith to the Word of God they were saved. That faith was counted as righteousness, but that righteousness was not secured until the Lamb of God was sacrificed, Jesus Christ himself. And then the, they received the blessing. And that's when, of course, they were able to enter into the presence of God into heaven. Um, the tabernacle uh, uh, on earth is temporary. Even the temple itself, the, the, the solid structure made of stone, uh, is temporary. Uh, but our high, high priest is higher than the heavens. He's interceding now on our behalf, seated at the right hand of the Father, as we're speaking right now. Uh, the law was uh, uh, involved in infirmity, weaknesses, the sinful priests. Uh, but the word of the oath, the Son is consecrated forever. Again, he's holy. 
the Levitical priesthood, they offered sacrifices daily, daily, which could never take away sin. Christ offered himself one time for sins forever. One sacrifice for sins forever. It's done. So those are some of the contrasts between the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood that we've already covered. And again, we'll go through chapter 10. We're in chapter 8. We'll go through chapter 10, dealing with the issue of, of the, the, the high priestly work of Jesus Christ on our behalf and the sacrifice that he offered in himself and his, his body and his shed blood. So now let's, let's continue looking at the text now in Hebrews 8, verse 1 through 5. Uh, and so the text says, uh, the author writes, he says, Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Or in other words, this is the, the focal point. Uh, this is the important points that I've done so far. Uh, we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man, Jesus Christ, have somewhat also to offer. For if, we were on, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve under the example and the shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Okay, so we're going to stop there. We're going to unpack this. We're talking about heavenly realities. As we're here meeting right now, Jesus Christ, and we read about his ascension, he ascended up into heaven and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is the reality. Where is Jesus Christ today? He is ascended up into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father and he sent the comforter in his place. And now we are indwelt with the Spirit of God and we're the body of Christ on the earth. And Christ the head is literally in heaven, seated literally at the right hand of the Father with his glorified body, the body that ascended up into the heavens is the body that he will descend with. And he is fully God, fully man, seated at the right hand of the Father. So let's unpack what these truths mean and, and we'll look at the so what. What's the, what's the, the cash value of this, you know? Uh, uh, what are the effects of Christ's uh, high priestly ministry? So first verse, verse 1, Now the things of which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now again, uh, when you think in contrast to the Levitical priesthood, there was not a single high priest that was able to ascend into the heavenly realm, into the very presence of God himself in heaven. But this is such a high priest that we have. And remember, he, the author is trying to persuade these Jews, these believing Jews, not to go back to that uh, sacrificial system as they are being tempted to do so that they're no longer persecuted. So we see that Jesus as a high priest is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. No Aaronic priesthood uh, first of all was ever even seated. Now remember Yom Kippur, the day of atonement was the day that the high priest, the one day only the high priest could go behind the veil the Shekinah glory of God is there manifest. This is particularly true of the tabernacle and the first temple. But after the first temple was destroyed, the Shekinah glory of God left the temple and departed and it was never returned. Even the second temple, it did not have Shekinah glory in there. And they didn't even have, they didn't even, in the second temple, they didn't even have the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. They had a stone that they offered the blood on the stone. It was the mercy, served as the mercy seat. But particularly in the temple, when, when God would lead the Israelites, remember it was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of, of, of cloud by day. And he would move and then the camp would tear down the, the tabernacle and move and then they'd set it up when, this, when, when God's presence would stop. And that presence would abide in the Holy of Holies over the mercy seat. And that is where the great, or not the great, but the earthly Levitical Aaronic high priest would go in Yom Kippur, Yom is day, Kippur is atonement. 
the Day of Atonement, he would go in and he would sprinkle blood on the altar or on the on the mercy seat first for himself, and then he was then able to go in and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat for all of Israel. And if you remember, he had to initially put this incense in there, and that incense would fill the the holy of holies, so that he had time. It, it put a buffer between him and God so he had time to go in and sprinkle the blood for himself lest God would kill him. So think about this. This is a terrifying thing. The, great, the, the high priest that would go in, the Levitical priest, probably dreaded Yom Kippur. It was a very sobering day. And if you remember, tradition teaches they had the bells, the, uh, the pomegranates and the bells around the, the, the bottom of the high priest's garment. And they put a rope around his leg. So if the bells quit chiming, they knew he dropped dead and they would pull him out so they wouldn't die going in there to drag his carcass out. It's a very fearful thing. And there was, that's the reason the veil was there. And it was, it, was not, uh, it was not to protect God from our sin. It was to protect the sinners from God's wrath that these, these curtains and barriers were there. So therefore, you never saw a high priest seated because they were constantly serving, constantly atoning or covering for sins. And remember, that's essentially a, the sacrifice would give a temporary covering of their sin. Then they would sin more than they needed to sacrifice. So every sacrifice was a reminder of their sinfulness. Okay? And so you never had an ironic priest or a high priest that was seated, but we see Jesus Christ seated. We've talked about this before. It means that it is finished. The labor, the work of, of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, was finished at Calvary. It is finished. And the, the high priestly service, he's offered his blood in heaven. Jesus Christ literally took his blood and took it into heaven. And I believe we will see the blood of Jesus Christ on that mercy seat. And that's there eternally. And so that propitiation was made. That eternal salvation is based upon that precious redemptive blood that is now in heaven in the mercy seat before the throne of God where Jesus Christ is seated next to the Father. Um, you never saw the high priest abide in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, again, the dwelling place of God. He never was like, yeah, I'm going to take a break before I go on back out and mingle with folk. Hanging here with the Shekinah glory. He sprinkled the blood, he got out of there. Okay? Um, so, but we see Jesus Christ abiding there in the presence of the Father. And of course, Jesus Christ is God. And we're going to see that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places now. That veil, remember, the veil was rent when Jesus died. The veil, the temple was rent from the top to the bottom, making access to God available to everyone. The priest could never do that. The high priest couldn't even get another priest. Hey, Bob, you want to come in with me this week? That's Yom Kippur. I think I can bring a guest in. That guest would die if he went in there. But now God has opened up that veil, and we now have free access to the Father. And now it's a throne of grace. It's no longer a throne of wrath. But God welcomes us sinners with our sin into his presence because of our great high priest who is seated at the right hand and is our intercessor, our mediator. All right? So this is all wonderful news, and this is the work of our great high priest. Verse 2 says uh, that Christ, a minister of the sanctuary, sanctuary means a holy place, and it means uh, really, it, it, it's a word closely related, related to, to holy or sanctified, and uh, it's, it's the dwelling place of God. Uh, he's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Now remember, a tabernacle, that's just Bible talk for a tent. The tabernacle was a tent. And it, it had two rooms, basically. The holy place and the most holy place. And then around that tent was a big cloth fence. And you came in through the front, you offered your sacrifice, the brazen altar was there, and that, uh, that was uh, appeasing the wrath of God for sin, the brazen altar. Then next was a, a brazen labor where the priests would wash their hands and their feet before they would minister. And that's a picture of us constantly being purified by Jesus Christ, right? Having our feet washed, ministering. Uh, this cleansing, it goes on. Then we go into the holy place. They maintain the, uh, the, the candlestick. 
they had the table of showbread, and they had the altar of incense. And so that's where the priests would minister throughout the year. But no one except the great high priest would go in uh, on the Day of Atonement. And, and that's the only time he could go in. He couldn't just go in any time. Um, now, but we have that free access now. We can go anytime. I mean, you think about these blessings that we have. It, it's, it's staggering what we have, the riches we have in Christ. Um, so this, the, the true tabernacle, there's one in heaven. There was one on earth, and there's one in heaven. And we're going to see that the one on earth was made. God showed Moses. You see this? Like Heaven's opened up. He's on the mount. He sees it says, that's how I want it made. And he made it. He was the mediator. He didn't actually himself make it, but God gifted people with the Holy Spirit. The primary artificer was uh, Bezalel. And God put his spirit in Bezalel, and he could see, he understood. Like, if you ever, anyone ever actually read through all the little, the little knobs and knops and, and all the little thingamajiggers? It's like, it's hard to understand. Bezalel, like... Duh, where's, where's my chisel? Where's the silver? Let me get started. Can't you see it? I mean, he had the ability, and he could craft it, and he taught other people, and then they put this all together. But the earthly one is a mirror of what's in heaven, the true tabernacle, the tent. And we see that the Lord pitched it. Jesus Christ pitched that tent for our eternal salvation. Right? These things are real. We're going to see that real tabernacle with our own eyes. We're going to touch it with our own hands, right? Because it's there. It's right now. And that's why we're saved, because this great high priest and the, the tabernacle is working. Um, so we see that um, he's set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. That's the throne of grace now. He is a minister of the sanctuary, the holy place. And that's why really, you know, you go, you go to churches and they say, oh, they're in the sanctuary. It's not really a sanctuary. This is, a, this is where we meet. God's presence, uh, the Holy Spirit is wherever we are. There's no room now that is, oh, that's the sanctuary. Coffee ends here. <laughs> <laughs> no snacks in the sanctuary. The inner sanctum. It's holy, right? It's the real sanctuary is in heaven. Um, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, I mean, that's what priests do. And, and again, what are these gifts and sacrifices? They were to appease God in his anger. And they had to be prescribed, had to be delivered in the, in the precise way, or else God would not respect that. And it would not cover the sin. So the priests, uh, they would offer the gifts and sacrifices. Okay, so... That's what the Levitical priesthood, wherefore, it is of necessity that this man, Jesus Christ, have somewhat also to offer. Well, we, we looked at the scripture last week, and Jesus Christ, uh, uh, let's see, ordained, the, the high priests are ordained, uh, they are, um, uh, what was the word I was looking for? I can't think of it. But they're ordained by God. And now remember, Jesus Christ is ordained by the oath of God. That he is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, and then God said, I have sworn and I shall not repent. I will not change my mind. This is an eternal, eternal priesthood that will not be changed or altered, unlike the Levitical priesthood. So now Christ is ordained. And what does he offer? He offered himself for our sins. And, and, you know, this passage, Genesis 22, 8, came to my mind. Remember, when, when Abraham is going to offer his only begotten son, and, uh, you know, Isaac starts to clue in, and he was, he was a young man. He, he could have very easily overthrown his father and said, no, I ain't doing this. Uh, but he's like, hey, Dad, a little question here. Uh, I, I see the wood. You, you've got the fire and, and definitely the knife. But where is the sacrifice at, <laughs> Dad? <laughs> and did anyone remember what, what Abraham told him? Uh, the Lord he said the Lord will provide. provide. He, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Well, that was a prophetic word. From, from Abraham. And we know it's prophetic because what was caught in the thicket when, when 
Say again? The ram. The ram. It wasn't a lamb. It was a ram that, mm -hmm. that he offered then. So this word was prophetic, and he wasn't speaking about that that uh, ram that was caught in the thicket in his horns. Which again, the caught, you know, caught in the thicket around the head, the crown of thorns around the head of the Lord <laughs> Jesus. Um, just rich imagery here. But so, so this, I mean, this is a summary of the great high priesthood of Jesus Christ. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So we see the role of God, God himself offering himself as a lamb. And this is in Jesus Christ. He is both the priest who offers the gift and is the gift itself. He is everything in our redemptive, uh, redemptive story. Um, okay, so he offered himself for our sins. And uh, it is one sacrifice for sin forever. And you know, the more you read this, the more you meditate on this, you have to really just say, how can anyone read these texts and think that I somehow have something to contribute to my salvation? It is, it is it's just downright nutty at its base level, but, but if you really persist in it, it's blasphemous. To say that, now the sacrifice that God offered is not adequate without my final touch of re my repentances and my pledges to keep the, the law of Moses. It's just absolutely insane. Um, also in terms of this, I, I, how many people remember this phrase, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker? Remember that? From, that's from Rub-a-Dub-Dub, -dub, right? Jen knew that, of course. Uh, I had to Google it, but I remember those three phrases, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. And I was thinking about that because uh, when you go to a butcher, you, you're going to, to have meat prepared. You're going to an expert in this field, and he is going to prepare the meat for you. And, and, and we go to a butcher sometimes down the street, and we'll get our meat. Um, a baker, well, I think of a wedding, and. Like, I'm going to go to the baker and I'll make a beautiful cake for the wedding and that's what they do, right? Well, instead of the candlestick maker, I put in the salvation maker. It's Jesus Christ. He's a high priest. And, and, and the job description of the high priest is to save people to the uttermost. That's what he does. We don't help him any more than I'd go in, hey, you're going to make the cake for my wedding on Tuesday? Well, I'll come in and help you with that. No one does that. They let the expert make the cake. They let the expert do their thing. Jesus Christ is our great high priest, and his work, his job description is to save sinners to the uttermost. That's what he does. And so to think that I'm going to come, oh, let me help you out, Lord, here. I'm going to, I'm going to clean up my life a little bit, and, and I'm, going to be, I'm going to be your, your all-star team, you know? No, we come as we are and allow the great high priest and his perfect sacrifice to totally appease the Father on our behalf and to give us the free gift of eternal life. So <clears throat> anyway, these are some of the thoughts, you know, as I'm thinking through this work that Jesus Christ is doing on our behalf and how it is a perfect work and the Father has accepted that work. Um, so now let's look at uh, verse 4. Uh, verses 4 and 5, it says that, uh, for if he were on earth, if, if, if Christ were on earth, he should not be a priest. And remember, when he was on earth in his earthly ministry, he never went in and, and, and did the priestly work. Now, he would, he would teach in the temple. He'd be in the courtyard of the temple. But he wasn't allowed even to go in because only the Levitical priesthood, only the Levites could go in and minister in, in the, the, uh, the temple, the holy place or the holy of holies. Jesus never went in there. Um, although now he's seated in, in the true tabernacle in the Holy of Holies because it's not a Levitical priesthood. It's the Melchizedek priesthood, the order of Melchizedek, an entirely different priesthood. If you're on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that uh, there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Okay. Verse 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. 
And you can find that where God tells him that in Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. And he repeats it again at the end of, of chapter 25. The interesting thing is that everything that was crafted and, and a part of the tabernacle, from the tent itself to everything, was seen in the heavenly realms. Okay, so, so here's this tabernacle, and then, you know, the tabernacle moved through the wilderness, and then finally, when they got into the promised land, they put the, the tabernacle down in, in Joshua's days in a place called Shiloh. And as I was studying this, I was thinking about our stop at Shiloh. And it, it's just, I mean, it gives you chills, man, because if you, you go up on this hill and you look down to the, ex, and they're doing excavation everywhere. Archaeologists are just all over the place. And you look down there, and there they found the stake holes, the, the tent for the, the tabernacle, is where it was actually at where they worship God there. And of course, what do you have? Then they, then they did away with the tabernacle when Solomon became the king and they built a temple, the Solomonic temple. And guess what? There's, there's that temple now, man. And it's bared. All the rocks were, of that temple were thrown over the side. You see the rubble on the side, a lot of it. Just like Jesus Christ prophesied that not one stone would remain upon another. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So here's this place where the shadow of the real thing was right there, and that's where they worship. This is, this is, these are anchors that, that point us into the heavenly realm. This stuff is real, what we're talking about here. It's not uh, blah, 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 Melchizedek, blah, 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 you know. But there's substance to these things. There's truth to it. So, so uh, the, the things that they served in were an example and a shadow. Right, the example I, I thought of the uh, the uh, the uh, Vietnam uh, the wall memorial that they've got the traveling version, the Vietnam memorial that goes around and, and, and it's it's just a, an example of the one that's actually in DC, the real one. So this tabernacle is just an example. It's it's a replica of what's going on in the heavenly realm. It's a shadow. It was a shadow. A shadow is cast by a substance. There's no substance to a shadow. But it takes the form of the substance when the light comes across it and it casts a shadow onto the earth. And that's where we're, we're, we're experiencing this. That's what that was. Now, again, think about the Jews as they are preparing to go back to the example and to the shadow. And to once again reject the Messiah. And I, I do think this is very, very closely related to the covenant. I think it will be a part of the peace covenant now. I've, I'm persuaded now that it will not be something that will begin before the seven year tribulation period that they'll build the temple before. I believe it is a part, a package of that covenant, that covenant with death. And it is that covenant that triggers the wrath of God, not only against the world, but the wrath of God against unbelieving and rebellious Israel to purify them uh, into the Messianic kingdom and bring salvation deliverance at the end of the tribulation period. Okay, so that is kind of a summary there. I think I covered everything on the content of the realities, the heavenly realities as we're here. And that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and he is interceding for us and we're going to see why that's necessary as we now look at the so what or the spiritual blessings our new position or the effect of the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. And one of the things, uh, to go back to the book, the Green, the Green Letters, the book fundamentally teach, is teaching a believer how to go from the position that we are in Christ to affecting our condition. From our, our biblical position in Christ to having that now overflow and affect our condition. Because the real problem within Christianity today, within, within the true body of Christ, is that we are so dumbed down that we govern our Christian life based on our condition rather than our position. So if something bad happens and, you know, we're all frazzled and, and oh, God's not happy with me, oh, he's angry and this is, this is, you know, I don't even know if I'm saved, you know, what you're talking about. To the Bible study, uh, but we, we allow our condition 
to govern our Christian life instead of our position coming over into our condition. So, so I want to look now at some of our positional truths, just a few of them, uh, as a result of the ascension of Jesus Christ and his high priestly work, offering himself, his body, and his shed blood, raising from the dead, ascending to heaven. So we look at Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy. Now, now that affected my prayer earlier uh, in our meeting. These are riches that are priceless. The mercy of God. That's a priceless nugget of eternal gold. And again, what do I say? You, you can't evaluate the riches of divine mercy by your flesh. What's the cash value of, of God's mercy? Can I get some coffee with divine mercy? No, you can't. Can, will it make my cancer go away? No, it won't. It'll give you eternal life and a glorified body, though. Yeah, give me the pottage. I want the pottage too right now. Yeah. That's what carnal believers do. That's how we function. We, we operate in our condition, and we don't value the riches of God's mercy. But God is rich in mercy. Why? For his great love wherewith he loved us. Now, this really popped today because I never fused these verses together in this quite this way. God is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins. Now, just stop right there. He had great love for us, and, and the byproduct or the, the birth of that was to yield and pour forth the riches of mercy on us even when, not now that we're redeemed, but even when we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead in sins. Even then, this is what his love was. And God hath quickened us. Now, point number one, he hath quickened us. So we were dead in sins. Point number one, he has quickened us together with Christ. Notice this, by grace ye are saved, this parenthetical statement. By grace ye are saved. This is the essence of salvation, is our quickening and our union with Jesus Christ. That is the substance of our salvation. Okay? So we have quickened us together with Christ. By grace, unmerited favor, you are saved, and hath raised us up together. And point number three, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So now go back into this imagery that we are now in the Holy of Holies. We are in Christ, seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father as we're here speaking right now. As we're here contemplating these truths, this is our position. And there's nothing that can alter that. There's nothing you can do that can alter that. He loved us even when we were dead in our sins. So what can you do now that would be worse than what you were doing when you were dead in your sins? Nothing. And it goes to Romans chapter 8 and you know just all the verses of Scripture on, on the assurances that we have. We've, he's quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. It's unmerited favor. Sinner, I'm pouring out mercy and grace. He hath raised us together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches there's that word riches again of his grace so now we see the currency the divine currency of, of uh, I mean we're going to have a currency crisis with the US dollar but there is never a currency crisis with the riches of God's mercy and the riches of his grace that he lavishes upon the sinner when who, who is dead in sins. And so we have this the riches of grace, uh, and he's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I mean, we, we, we just really cannot fathom what the glory is going to be like, what the joy will be like, when we enter into that glorification at the rapture of the church or, or even our departure when we're separated from this carnal flesh that, that, that just loves sin as much as it did the day it was born or conceived, uh, you know, when we're separated from that influence. Um, so his kindness toward us, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. What part of not of yourselves do we not get as human beings? All of it. All of it. 
Exactly. We're reading about the work of our great high priest who ascended into heaven with his own blood, died on the cross for our sins, shed his blood for us, took it into heaven, appeased the wrath of God for our sins, and then we say, oh, wait, I got something to do now. No, it says very clearly, it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. See, God is giving the gifts to us. And he, 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 gave, he gave up his only begotten son to redeem us. We didn't have to say, okay, I've got to craft together some sacrifice and make God happy. No, God took care of that part too in his son. So, so we're saved, it's, it's, it's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. What part of that don't we get? I think I've pounded the pulpit reading that several times. Not of works, not of works. It's like a football chant. And we still don't get it. Oh, God's mad at me because I did this and this and this today. Oh, I did that. Oh, why did I do that? It's not of works. God's never angry with us. He's... His wrath has been appeased in Christ. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And then you'll have someone come on like a like a Ray Comfort <laughs> and tell you, oh, you yeah, you've got to you've got to repent of your sins, which means you've got to keep the law of Moses. Stop stealing, stop lying, stop blaspheming, stop lusting. Really, Ray? Have you stopped lusting, Ray? You minister on the on the California beaches. The lady folks skate by you and you don't look at them with a lustful thought? Now you're lying if you say you don't. It's not of works. It's grace. So this is our position in Christ. So three things. He quickened us with Christ. He raised us with Christ and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That's where we are. That's where God esteems us because our spirit has been joined to Christ and he's seated in heavenly places. So that's where we are. Um, okay, so that, that's the, the riches of divine grace, the riches of his mercy, riches of his kindness, riches of his grace. Now we look at uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, and now we get an exhortation here. Uh, Paul writes, he says, if you then be risen with Christ, if you be, be risen with Christ, and we are, we just read that, then seek those things which are above. Here is our exhortation. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Not on things on the earth. The word for set your affection is phroneo. And it's really interesting because I've just been doing a word study on the mind and thoughts and just everything dealing with the mind and seeing God's perspective on the mind. And so when this says, set your affection on things above, it's the word phroneo, and it's the mind. He's, he's calling us to think about. What? What am I supposed to think about? Things above where you're seated. This is our command. Set your mind on things above. Not, as where Christ is sitteth the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Okay? Things above, not on things of the earth. And what, what Paul is writing about is a shift of consciousness. A shift, an actual shift of our consciousness. Stop being conscious of this world. Start being conscious of the world to come, where you're actually seated. And that is the battle right there. That is the spiritual warfare. Because as soon as we leave church, we kick back into the flesh rut. I got to do this. And everything in the world becomes number one priority. And we are washed over. And it's very hard to lift our eyes back up and look up into the heavenly realm and to think, begin to think about the things in heaven. Well, what are the things in heaven? It's Christ. It's understanding and unpacking and abiding in Christ where you receive the riches of mercy, the riches of grace. And as you do this, anxiety slowly disappears and you don't even realize what's happening. There's a transformation as your consciousness is transferred not to the earthly things, but to the heavenly. And look, these, these devices are wonderful, but at the same time, think about it, man. <laughs> We know things because of devices like this 
Oh, in the South China Sea, this is going on right now. Da, 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 da. Oh, and all of that's going on. This is going on over here. Da, 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 da. Ah! <laughs> I'm just as guilty, and I'm not saying that there's not value in, in you know, being aware of, of, of the signs of the times, okay? But, but for me, it's like, Okay, what, what, is, what consumes your time? Is it the things of the earth in your mind? Is it the things of the earth or is it the things of, above? And it's, it's pretty, mathematically, it's pretty easy to start to calculate and say, you know what, I need to shift more into the heavenly realm and less into, you know, breaking news, Amir Sarfati. Amir sent out a, a text. <laughs> Amir sent out a, a blast on Friday. I didn't call you. <laughs> I think it was Friday. It might have been Thursday night. China has sent out a war declaration. And then, like, his next post is, good night from London. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. So, well, here we are. Nothing happened, you know. I mean, they actually did back down. I, they actually did not invade. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what happens, this is just one example where my mind, particularly this Chinese situation, is really focused on that. And could it have turned to war? Sure, but but the point here is that's that's not where our focus is to be. Our focus, uh, the centerpiece of our thoughts, are to be in the heavenly places. And do you know what? I, I think I shared this. I did. I think I did share it. Yeah, because as I was studying this, uh, the the mind. You know, the way that we love God with all of our mind is by thinking about Him. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's not like. Oh, I gotta work up this love feeling for God in my mind. That's not it. You just say, Lord, here's my mind, Philip. That's how you love God with your mind. We make it this mystical thing, or I do. Oh, well, I'm thinking about God. I'm thinking about His Word and meditating on that. But that, that that's not what God wants. He wants me to really love Him with a feeling, you know, like and Satan throws that garbage in, and you never achieve it. It's always mystical. You, you never achieve it, so you throw your hands up and say, I can't do it. No, you're doing it. If you're meditating on God, you are loving God with your mind. You open your mind and say, Lord, fill it. Just give him the time. Give me the time. Give me your mind. Let me be the center of your thinking. And then all this other stuff starts to slowly wither. Okay? But again, the flesh doesn't like the book. It doesn't like the book. <laughs> A funny story. Um, we're talking about the riches of God, and, and yet um, last week was a rough week for me. Um, and yet, uh, I, I think I mentioned flickering pixels. That was my term for video games when my son was constantly consumed with them. So, I, uh, you know, the flickering pixels, you know, that's all it is. <laughs> it's lights that you, it mesmerize you in, in the shape of a human running or shooting a gun. That's all it is with sound. So, I'm preaching last week, I, you know, this will be transparent uh, Sunday. I'm preaching last week, and it was one of those moments, those worst pastoral moments. I'm looking around, and phones are out, and uh, games are being played, and uh, noises are being made, and cell phones are going off, and people are asleep, and, and I'm like, we value a flickering pixel card game more than the riches of the Word of God. That is really an indictment against uh, of the carnality of the body of Christ. And I'm just, I, look, I, this thing is always by me. I'm still Pavlov's dog when it dings. What? <laughs> Bing, burp, burp, ding. Oh, what was that one? You know? And, and so there's definitely a self-control issue here, but, but this, is, this is the state, and why is it? Because we mind earthly things. Look, that's what we do, we mind earthly things. They're the priority in our, in our lives, and that's why the church, we're in the Laodicean age of the church, lukewarm, hey, I'm good to go, I got everything. Viewing everything from a worldly perspective. Uh, so anyway, so our section, our, our, our affection on things above, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. He's telling us why. You are dead. We were crucified with Christ, and now we're risen. We're, we're born again. We're creatures, eternal creatures with eternal life and the righteousness of God, and heirs of the kingdom of God himself, and heirs of Christ. 
And so we need to turn our affection, our mind to these things and begin to evaluate and shift our estimation, our value system in a new consciousness shift away from the earth and into the heavenly realm where Christ is. Um, for our life is hid with Christ in God when Christ, this is point number four, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So now we, he's given us three positional facts. In Ephesians, he wrote, we're quickened with Christ, we're raised with Christ, we're seated with Christ. And now he gives us a promise, which is a future uh, foundation of hope. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall appear with him in glory. That is our future. It cannot be changed or altered. This is our what the biblical hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right? So, so these are the things that are to shape our mind, and then we begin to transcend uh, the things of this world, and it begins to emit a fragrance of Christ. There's something different about us because, you know, we're not on Prozac and, uh, you know, uh, schizophrenic and, and all this stuff, you know, whatever label they want to put on us. 1 John 2, 1 and 2, I'll just quickly go through this. My little children, these things are written to you, I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So guess what? We have an advocate. He's right there. And, and, and again, I've shared this before. It's not as though the Father says, hmm, he's sinned. Jesus, what say you? No, the Father is all on board. <laughs> okay? They're in, they're in harmony with each other in this intercessory work. The Father has already lavished this great love. Uh, he, he's, he's in agreement with the Son. But Christ is the advocate, and he pleads his own blood, his own sacrifice to the Father. Uh, and notice this. He is the propitiation for our sins. I've got sins. He's my propitiation. I sin more. He's my propitiation. He's the propitiation for my sins. Well, what is propitiation? A big Bible word. That which makes God favorably inclined to a sinner. That's what propitiation is. It is that which makes God favorably inclined toward me. And it has nothing to do with what I've done or added to anything. It is Christ who is my propitiation for my sins and yours. These are positional truths. And if you never flee these positional truths, you'll never be rocked by satanic assault or spiritual warfare because if he can't pry you out of Christ then he's doomed. He can't do anything about it. Now let's look at someone, let's look at an example of someone who has shifted their consciousness to heavenly things. Revelation 12, 10, 11, we'll, we'll end on this past, these passages here. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength of the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren word for accuser there is the plaintiff, the one who, who makes accusation in a court of law. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, now, part of our problem, and I can't wait to get to this part in Hebrews, is our conscience. The Christian conscience, you can have an evil conscience. And an evil conscience is a conscience that contradicts the justification work of Jesus Christ and says, you are condemned. You have sinned. Our own conscience will do that. And, and, and the reason it does that is because we've not trained it with the word of God. We've not put our mind in the heavenly realm and said, ah, 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 conscience, straighten up here. We're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> and the conscience has to be, be trained in this way and purified with the, the blood of Christ. But notice this. He accuses them, so this is our second accuser. Satan accuses us before God day and night. And I've, I've shared this verse a lot of times. I go back to it a lot because it's so powerful. Satan does not need to make up lies to accuse us before God. He's got plenty of accurate descriptions of our sins and transgressions that we have committed. Because how does he know? Well, he enticed us to sin. And then he turns around, he, he makes it sin look enjoyable. And then once we in the trap, then he turns it and uses it to condemn us, right? <laughs> and we fall for it all the time. So, so now he's accusing us before God, right? He's 
in there accusing us a day and night. Right? It's a relentless ass assault on, a, on us. It says, and they, the brethren, they overcame him by, number one, the blood of the Lamb. Remember that blood that's on the mercy seat in heaven there? Yeah, you got an accusation? <laughs> Tell it to the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> Tell it to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan. So they stood in their position in Christ, and they overcame the accuser that accused them before God day and night, number one, by the blood of the Lamb. It's a positional truth now that's carried over into their condition. Okay? They, they're now overcoming the accuser. They are overcoming. Their condition is now no longer defeat, but victory as they stand their position in Christ. They overcame, number one, by the blood of the Lamb. That is a defensive uh, uh, response. Number two, and by the word of their testimony, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that is the sword of the Spirit that we have? And that's why Satan says, put down that sword. We're ashamed of the gospel. We don't share it. We just don't tell people, oh, I don't know what they think about me. Anybody says, I don't know. I don't want to say nothing. I'll just pray some more. <laughs> We're all guilty of it. So he gets us to put down the sword. Right? That's our offensive weapon is that gospel that brings people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus Christ by faith. Number three, they love not their lives unto death. And this is where their consciousness has reached that point of maturity where they understand the true value of this old mud man that's, that's decaying and dying. And there's nothing you can do to prevent that. There's still a day in the calendar at which you're separate your spirit will separate from your flesh and you will physically die. Okay? Klaus Schwab cannot change that with his implants. Nothing can change that day. It's on the calendar. Okay, but these people love not their lives unto death. They were willing to lay down their physical lives in order to wield the sword of the spirit. And why are they able to do this? Because they are, they are, are, are forneto. Their mind is filled with with the things above. And for them, it's just, they can, they can, it's so palpable, they can see Christ. I mean, it's that palpable in their day-to-day -day condition and experience because they are not looking at, they're not filled with the things of this earth. And so, <clears throat> this is, I'll just go ahead and conclude there, but this is how we take these positional truths, the realities of heaven, what God has, has secured in Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm, and how they trickle down and they affect our condition, our day-to-day -day condition, and transform us if we will open our mind to the Word of God, though that is the key. Um, it's funny. <laughs> you know, there's, there's all sorts of teachers right on TV. You know, they're a dime a dozen. 90...